The reason why my father became indebted was, my father was a very trustworthy person, and people trusted him a lot. People had a lot of reliance in him. So often people would come with large sums and address my father and say, Oh, Zubair, there's 100,000 dirhams, please take care of it. I leave it in your trust as an amanat. My father would decline. And my father would say, No, I'm not going to take it as a trust. For the simple reason, subhanallah, I wonder if there are humans like this in the entire world. My father would decline and say, no, if I take it as a trust, as an amanat, and then it gets misplaced, or it is stolen, without negligence on my part, then your money is gone. In other words, that is the rule, if someone leaves a trust with you, uh, and then not because of any negligence on your part, but it gets lost or misplaced or stolen, then he, that man cannot claim anything from you, it was just as a trust by you, as an amanat. So as Zubair radiallahu anhu would say, you know what, you're going to leave that money with me. Perhaps some unforeseen circumstances could prevail, your money would be lost. Why don't I secure your money for you and let me take this amount as a debt. If I take it as a debt, whatever happens, your money is secured. So in this manner, people would come and leave money as trust. But my father, in the interest of that man, would take the trust as a loan. And say, no, no, I've taken this as a loan. 50,000, okay, I've borrowed this money from you. Now whatever happens, I am responsible to give this money back to you. And in this way, people came and gave my father. My father never refused. He took that money and he says, I have borrowed so much money. He never stretched his hand. But when people came to trust him, why desire in good for the ummah? He would then take that wealth and channel it in avenues of good. Brothers, once upon a time, this was the quality of a believer. Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. His brothers who had animosity for him, who had hatred for him, and who had plotted his assassination, the Quran makes mention, They separate Sayyidina Yusuf from the father. Understand this here. And uh, they beguile the father, they lie to the father that we're taking him for some entertainment. Yarta, he will play, he will eat. Wa yalab, and he will play. Wa inna lahu lahafidun, we will take care of him. Sayyidina Yaqub had cited in this young lad of his uh, that he was going to grow up and become a Nabi. Hence he had a special love and he had a special, you know, compassion for Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. Finally the brothers separate him. The Mufassirin have written, when they separated son from the father, they dropped him on the floor. And then they started now arguing, should we kill him or should we just abandon him? Finally, they agreed, let's drop him in a deserted well. This was done by his own blood brothers. But what is the teachings of a Nabi? They come to that well. Yusuf salam pleads as a young boy, as a lad. Oh my brothers, what are you doing to me? Is this brotherhood? Is this what you display to me? And they agree with no mercy. In a harsh and a crude way, they unanimously, the Quran says, drop him in this deserted well, infested with insects. Allah sends Jibreel to rescue Yusuf alayhi salam at the bottom of this well. And Allah inspires to him in this tender age of his. That Yusuf bear it patiently, a time is to come. We will give you such honor, you will narrate these happenings to these very same brothers of yours in more detail than they can tell it to you. You will identify one and each one of them while they will fail to identify you. So this is the hatred they displayed against Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. Anyway, the future of Yusuf alayhi salam, who can stop the future of Yusuf alayhi salam? starts unfolding and gradually starts taking shape. From there he comes out, he goes to Egypt, he goes to the minister's house. And in due time and course, he becomes the king of Egypt. In the interim, the king seen a vision. I don't want to go through the different, different explanations. Coming to the point of focus. The king of Egypt sees a vision that seven thin cows have been devoured, or seven fat cows have been devoured by seven thin cows, which denoted seven years of prosperity and then seven years of famine and starvation. Finally, that period came after many, many decades had passed. Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam sitting on the throne of Egypt. And that picture which the Quran described, and Allah had told Yusuf alayhi salam comes before him and he becomes a reality. He's now sitting on the throne of Egypt in full power and authority. The brothers of Yusuf walk into the court. And as they walk into the court, he makes each one of them out. These are those very brothers of mine who dropped me and perhaps forgot about me. They did not recognize him. They thought the chapter was over. The man is dead and gone. Allah brought him and honored him. They came also like everybody else came to come and buy some, some grain and some corn. Yusuf alayhi salam had a brief meeting with them, but he did not divulge the secret. After having a brief meeting, he ordered that each one of them be given a camel load of corn and grain. And then subhanallah, 
before dispatching, he addresses one of the servants in the court. وَقَالَ لِفِتْيَانِهِ جَعَلُوا بِطَاعَتَهُمْ فِي رِحَالِهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَعْرِفُونَهَا إِذَا انْقَلَبُوا إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِمْ يَرْجِعُونَ He calls one of the servants. He says, you see, these men that have come, these are my brothers. They have brought money, but I feel shy to take money from my blood. How can I take wealth from my own blood? Do me a favor, take this money and put it back in their saddle bags. Whatever they have done, but they are my blood. Can I exploit their desperation to make money? Is that the message that I give on at this stage? Which brothers, those that dropped him in the well, those that abandoned him, those that separated him. But what was the akhlaq of Yusuf alayhi salam? How can I make money? Brothers, let us ask ourselves a question. While every one of us here, perhaps most of us are in a position of employing, Allah has made us owners and bosses. While we entertain the noble endeavor of expanding in our businesses and moving from a basic car to a luxurious car, and from a simple home to a wonderful home, and from national vacations to international vacations. I wonder if we entertain this frame of mind for our employees when we decide in the salary. Or is it, uh, do we, does Islam advocate a selfish attitude that I will exploit you? Uh, this man that is working for me, is he also not building a future? Does he also not have a wife and a child? Or do I only capitalize on my own thing? Do I only plan my future? I'm asking you brothers, take it to heart. Do you take into consideration to say, as I want to go ahead and I want to expand those people that are under my employment. They are also humans, then they have equal desires and ambitions. Do we entertain these ambitions on their behalf or not? Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam says, tell them to go back. This is my blood. I cannot take money from them. This is the akhlaq. I had a wonderful experience. Three weeks ago, we were in Canada. Subhanallah. This is the brotherhood of, of Muslims. And... Uh, after I completed the program in Toronto, one brother invited me in, in the province called Saskatchewan, the capital of which is Regina. So one brother from Toronto insisted that he wants to join me with, on, on, on the trip and he wants to come there for the programs. We got to the airport, he didn't have a ticket, he said he'll book a ticket the last minute. Naturally, it's going to be costly. The same ticket, which is $500, is going to cost you $2,000. So he went, they went to the counter, I'm talking of three weeks ago. He went to the counter, they said, no, 2,000, 2,200. I told him, you know what, that's an exorbitant amount. Just to join me for two-day program, you'd rather sit here, spend that money somewhere else. But he was somehow very passionate, and he says, no, no, Malan, I want to come with you, I want to come with you. We decided to go read namaz there. There was an interfaith prayer room. While we were performing salah, one brother came who had a uniform. He was working at the airport of Somali origin. So this brother said, this is perhaps my last chance to try. He says, brother, can you do me a favor? You know what, I want to go with the sheikh, he's from South Africa, we're having a program. I wonder if you can just get me a ticket now, if you, you know, can just bypass some formalities. He says, no problem, brother, you perform your salah, after asr it will be done for you. He took the ticket, he just waved the late booking, and he did it, and he came and he gave it, and he said, make dua for me on your way. That brother, wallah, left an indelible impression on my heart and mind. We didn't know him from a bar of soap, but just on the grounds of this is a Muslim brother, I can make life easy for him. He took duas for me, and wallah, he taught me a lesson. Brothers, this is the nature of a Muslim. Wherever he is, the Quran says to teach good, to make things easy for someone, to simplify. Take the incident of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. There is a warrant of arrest for him. He kills a person innocently in Egypt. Finally, one brother comes to him, a Muslim, and tells him that, you know what, Fir'aun and his men, his intelligence want to locate you. Why don't you leave Egypt and go? So what inspiration, he then flees from Egypt. And he moves on and he walks in a direction in no man's land. He doesn't know where he's heading for. He has no food. He has no provisions. He's totally stranded. Walking for days and days, he finally comes into Madian. When he comes into Madian, the ulama are saying he had hunger of days. He is totally lost. He has no sense of direction. There is a warrant of arrest against him. He comes and he lies in a land. He doesn't know what is the future. Future is looking totally bleak. He comes under one tree and he rests there. Now... We know when a man travels today, we're traveling in the best of conveyances. Yet when you're flying for so long, you're jet lagged, you're not in a frame of mind. You can't help anyone, you can't even understand what's happening. Sayyidina Musa in this condition, you know, with so much uh, challenges surrounding him, he comes and he lies under the tree, resting there, totally lonely, stranded, perplexed, doesn't know what the future holds. And while he's lying there, hopeless, helpless, and just wondering what is the future, he finds that there is a well there. The Quran makes mention of this. And the shepherds were coming with their respective flocks to come and give it water. At a distance, he finds two young girls with total modesty, withholding their flock and waiting very patiently. And from their dressing, he could see that these were definite Muslims. So he approaches them, Ma khat bukuma. He's tired, he's hungry, he's exhausted. But he finds two Muslim women stranded. The sentiments of brotherhood. Wallah, brothers, when the world is moving in one direction, 
And that is the crave of materialism, the crave of amassing, the crave of accumulating, the crave of usurping and snatching from the next man. Can we not revive another angle of life to make the world understand there can be another meaning to life? You can also earn to provide for someone else. This is the reason why the Nabi of Allah came. When everybody wants to better his own, can we not become those who want to better the life of someone else? يُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا those that give preference to others, even if difficulty comes their way. Anyway, he was motivated by sentiments. Some feeling came into him. He said, my sisters, you look desperate. Why are you standing here with great modesty? They said, oh stranger, uh, there are a lot of men there. And if we have to go into the crowd, we will rub shoulders with strange men, which is definitely forbidden and prohibited. And perhaps you might wonder why there's no men folk from our home. Our father is old and his age, hence he cannot represent us. So this is our practice. We wait here patiently. When all the shepherds are gone, then gradually we come. We take our flock, we give it water, and then we return home. Wallah, in this moment of desperation, this was enough. To see the desperation of these girls, this Nabi was motivated by sentiments. He said, no, no, my sisters, you wait one side. He took that flock, he went into the crowd. He moved the people, lifted the lid, gave it water, and then returned the flock to those girls, and he said, back on your way. What was the burqat of this? There is a riwayat, one person came to Abdullah bin Mubarak, rahmatullahi, and he says, oh Abdullah, I'm suffering an ulcer on my knee. Kharajat fi rukbati. There's an ulcer, and blood is flowing profusely. وَقَدْ عَالَجْتُ بِأَنْوَاعِ الْعِلَاجِ وَسَأَلْتُ الْأَطِبَّةِ فَلَمْ أَنْتَفِعْ بِهِ I've been to doctors, I've been to physicians, but somehow there is no symptoms of recovery. Could you perhaps, uh, you know, prescribe some dua, some reading, some, something Islamically that Allah can aid me? So Abdullah bin Mubarak says, yes, definitely. Why don't you make some service available to mankind? And ideally, look for a place where people are living in abject poverty, where even basic water is not available. I promise dig a well there and make water available for those that don't have water. Before that man will take the first sup, Allah will cure you immediately. This man got happy and he went. Nabi alayhi salam says in one hadith that that person whom Allah has given wealth, fame, authority, he must understand after Allah has afforded him these opportunities, Allah will direct some of his creation towards him to have the needs fulfilled. If he understands that this is the due of what my Lord has favored, and he will respond and avail himself in the name of the honor, the fame, the respect, the dignity, the wealth that Allah has given him, then Allah will multiply what he enjoys. But if he will decline, Allah will snatch. If he will decline, the one, look at the such deep words, the one whom Allah has favored, he must understand, coupled with those favors will come the needs of creation. Perhaps your brother, perhaps your neighbor, perhaps your sister, someone would see into it that after all this is a friend of mine, this is a relative of mine. He will build some hopes in you. Allah will direct his creation. If you will capitalize, Allah will increase. If you will abuse, Allah will snatch. So he says, I went to that place, I dug a well. Allah cured me immediately and permanently. Anyway, Sayyidina Musa, look at the barakat, I end with this brothers. Serving one person, making the need, making it available. When Sayyidina Umar was walking and patrolling the streets of Medina, and he seen a caravan that came there and they were stranded, he said, told his servant, on the day of Qiyamah, Allah will judge me, that how have I welcomed these people? He went, he arranged for some food and provisions, he brought it, he gave it to them. The woman then put up the pot of food and she was cooking, and then the children were playing. And he stood one side and he just observed the picture. Then he told his servant, do you know why I am standing here? So the servant says, no, I don't know. He says, when I came, I seen these, fa says, these faces were sad and grieved, and they were in full of sorrow. Now I see them smiling. It just brings joy to me to see one Muslim that is happy. May Allah Ta'ala inspire us with that akhlaq. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah.